And I'll have to say that this is the most, uh, out of all the builds on River Road thus far, uh, roofing this station is, was the most taxing. Not stressful, just tiring, like just no, it just didn't seem to end. Okay, so here's the part that you might find interesting. So this is the front part of the awning of the roof on the front of the station, which is this section that runs. You can see the upper where the windows are here. These two windows is up here and it runs all the way along and actually comes out with this almost a kind of a facade of a gable roof. It's kind of interesting. They're not all like that, but this one happens to be. So I'll probably model that in. So I did put some overrun on this sheet, see? But I just wanted to show you this part because uh, this is why I couldn't shingle this side yet until that was on because you start at the bottom here and then you just lay them on top, each strip all the way up, right? Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, if anyone was wondering about this ridge right here, uh, that's to stop the snow from sliding down and injuring people uh, due to the types of melt factors with, uh, you know, the temperatures. It, it's like it was meant for the snow to hang up and then melt down and, and drain off, not s slide off. So they have them on both sides and on some of the upper gables as well. So I'll be modeling those as well. But anyway, so you can see how you know, there's the hip roof, right? It looked even more severe with the frames, but once you get it fr uh, shingled, it's not that much. It's subtle enough that it's there, and I really like that. Okay. So you can see that this is one piece, right? And then what I did was is I just glued in a little two by threes on the bottom to sit on across this beam here because uh, there are rafters up in there, and if you get underneath and look, uh, you'll be able to see at least uh you know a hint of that anyway okay because i thought that was a nice detail to add in there and then i'll probably do some of that in here maybe we'll see but um okay Okay, the roofing shingles. I got so immersed into the roof that I just about forgot. Sorry. Um, like I started shingling you know, the sides here because it's the way they are. You can see here this, there's this regular siding, right, which is horizontal and then, which I used V-groove for. And then you can see the shingles on the side in the upper half, which I've done except for this side. But I started the roof, I did this roof, and see this ridge here, this anti, what's well, to stop snow from sliding off. I wonder what these were, they're on almost each gable uh, roof panel. So I was able to model it here, which is one of the advantages to the strip shingling by TC Train Group, so I'll show you in a sec. It's a bit tedious, but is it ever satisfying? You get a beautiful roof, like you even get the, you know, the little shingle, like there's the molding I built up from right angle and quarter round, which is really simple to do. Just a piece of right angle onto the roof before the shingles, then a piece of quarter round glued in, and then I lay the shingles over top. Um, I'll just show you how I lay these on, but I'll show you a couple of options. I mean, there are quite a few shingles. Some are good, some are bad. Like these are really good. Uh, the bad might be the vacuum form ones. These are by Wills, like they're slabs, right? Like you can see they have the scalloped kind of you know, some classic Victorian homes have these on the upper parts like here. You'll see this kind of thing. Um, and then there's these shingles. Like these are good for smaller buildings if you're just doing one gable, you know. The problem is, is if you try to span these, you're always looking for the smallest seam because it's hard to hide the seam. I mean, you can if you, ch if you scarf the edge and you can hide the seam, but it's a lot of work. Um, if you can keep the seam down to a small piece, like if you were to cut this like that and then just run a seam here, let's say, you can do that as well. That will make short work for you. And these are really well done by Pico. Okay, so these are uh, wills from Pico, right? So they're pretty good. Okay, type of styrene. Or you can use these. So these are by TC train group, which I really love, like they really get the detail, like windows and like, especially cage ladders. They, I think they do the best cage ladders ever, like over anybody. 
And they're not photo etched too, so they're 3D, they're not flat, like an etched flat brass. But these slate roof shingles, which can double as uh, shake roofing shingles as well, because the detail's so small, and the uh, detail on them, okay, is uh, really good uh, for HO. You can see these little lines, which would simulate grain. But uh, what I'll do is, uh, before I zoom in, I'll just show you, they come on a fret like this, there's six. And I basically just run a number 11 blade gently like two or three times, really gently first to get a nice straight line because you want all of that. And then they just cut through like butter. So, I mean, they've mounted them on there because that's the way they're molded. And and then I stroke them with, um, you know, just the backside with a bit of 60 grit because it helps the solvent, it makes it more aggressive. You get a better bond when the solvent hits a grainy surface. So I just cut a whole bunch like into strips like this, okay? And I'll show you, I'll, I'll just zoom in close closer and I'll show you how they go on, okay? Okay, so just a couple of things quick. Uh, number one is I put a piece of tape down here because this deck's already finished and painted. And what'll happen is I'll end up dropping a big blob of glue on here, <laughs> right? So that's why that's there. And then I'll mask off this bottom when it's finally finished, when I paint just a wide piece around. But um, so you can see how I start a strip, right? And notice the lines, like remember how I used the siding? It's just the same siding as, as this that I used on here. You can use uh, different widths of this. It just depends how you want your registry marks, right? So that you can run your strip so that you don't run out. But you can use plain and then just pencil it on if you want, but I'd like to avoid doing that if I can. So I like to just make sure it's a fresh bottle of cement that's fairly thin, like a really liquidy uh, style. And I just get a piece started and then I pull tight and I just look at my registry mark to try to keep it straight all the way down and like I'll just put a spot right here okay and then I'll pull that tight all right just so that it 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 goes as far back to where the line ends you can see where the tile line ends so I play it right as much as I can because I want to purchase as much square inches as I can okay so that's what I do. So I just tack it there and then possibly at the end or in the middle. And then when I'm done, uh, you know, when I'm satisfied that it's lined up, because see how you can move the long center part now? Like when you have it anchored there, you avoid making a gluey mess. But see how I can move that? I can look down this line now and I can see that it's straight. Or I can even, you know, put a straight edge on it. Like that. Or along like this because it makes a difference when you keep these straight because they can start to run out on you when you're chasing the tile you know and then once I do that I take some of this cement and I just run a bead down the back side that's it because I don't want glue to get into these separate tile cuts because it can tend to mushroom out and kind of mess things up for you but once you do a few, like start on the back side of your roof that won't be seen, and once you get a feel for it, uh, you'll be well on your way.
Okay, so I've almost closed this up. Um, you can see I had to put a few braces in here. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because uh, you don't want to get the flexion. Like when you put this final cap on, you find that with plastic. One of the challenges with working with plastic when you use thin material like this, and for good reason, you want to get close to scale for edges and things, you know, that, you know, look like this, right? you got to brace things like it's you don't have to do it like the real world, but you do have to cheat the structure, so to speak. You know, I can always remember when I first started in the film industry. Um, you know, you got to start at rock bottom with sweeping candy glass on a soundstage floor. And I remember my supervisor coming up to me and saying, you know, if you want to go far in this industry, you got to remember one thing. And, and I was like, oh, yeah, what's that? And he said, there are no problems, only solutions. And if you can indoctrinate yourself with that colloquialism, you'll go far in this industry. And so I did. I used to, you know, um, recite it to myself every day for weeks. And then it became part of my philosophy and I was successful. Pretty neat, eh? Pretty neat thing that he imparted to me, even though I didn't like the guy. <laughs> I didn't like him too much in the end. But, you know, you got to be honest, right, you know, about yourself. And it's the way it is when you get older, right? If you can't be honest with yourself, you won't be honest with people. But anyway, um, that'll close up that part. And then I'll just see how there's a little bit of a edge there. Um, I'll, I'll glue it like that. And then I'll just, you know, carve it down, shave it down. So I get a nice clean corner like this. And then I got to do these upper gables and I'll have the basic roof structure plated in. Um, and if there's any little run out like this here, like see that corner there? Um, I'll just look at that. Uh, I can either cut this down the, the, to trim this a bit or even pack this out, add a strip. I might add a strip to this because I want this to come out just a little bit more and I'd rather not take off any more because I want this roof to run into this roof a certain amount like it is, like some, like they vary on the prototype, but okay. Okay, so I just wanted to show you this before I closed it all up. So here's the final uh, gable plate for the dormer here. You can see it's this, these here on both sides. Um, they were a little bit tricky. Like everything here was actually a little bit tricky to get square. It's maybe easier than it looks, but it's not like super difficult either because you're just doing trial runs and trimming things. And once you get one piece done, they're all pretty close and you just a matter of just checking. And then even if you do get this on like this one, uh, it looks like it might be inside just a shade, maybe 15 thou. I can just put a strip on the front there just to bring it, to make it perfectly, you know, um, in line with the other side here. So, so that there, see what would be, uh, yeah, this is the, uh, yeah, this is the back side here. I'll just show you. Um, you can see this is here and this here is a little bit different uh, on the model I built it more to the prototype drawing uh, this was sort of a caretakers add-on thing or something but the actual prototype had a sort of a sloped roof at the back which is what I did I didn't make it as large as this but this wasn't originally part of the station anyway the one that i built is prototypically correct which would have been the way this building was originally but um they all have little slight variations but i like the way that turned out don't you um it was a lot of work to get it all you know sort of balanced because i noticed that some of them ch uh, differ like you see where this gable or the dormer comes down and meets this roof well, some of them came almost right to where my finger is, and some are set back a ways. I was studying photographs in, uh, here, I'll just show it to you since I have the book out already. Uh, you can sort of see, like right here, that particular dormer is set back quite a ways from the edge of this roof. And then when you look, like that one is as well. But when you look at other, actually this one's quite a bit higher than actually, this one runs right down to the roof slope. Whereas this one has a bit of a return on it. Like I noticed that when you build a model, you start noticing things like that. 
Um, like here's a weird thing. Like so, this is uh, uh, stucco, right? And you look at this sort of half rounded kind of bulge there. I'm not sure what that is, to be honest. But anyway, um, I'm pretty happy with the way um, it's turned out. Like it seems balanced and authentic enough um, for HO scale. Okay. Okay, so just to finish off the roof, then you can see these uh, shingles, these capping shingles right here. They go on the corners of the gables and on the rooftops and even down in here. So I'll show you how I make these with the, the TC train group uh, shingles. So what I do is I take a strip like this and I basically just cut two of them, okay? Where the line is. Okay. Like that. All right. And then what I do is, is I take a number 18 blade and this ruler like this. Okay. And I'll show you what I do is I, I push this down. Sorry if the knife's in the way, but it's the only way I can do this on camera. And then I get underneath like this and I just lift it straight up and let go like that. So I put that straight edge on there and lift straight up, let go like that. You can see that how they bend, okay? It doesn't take long, like uh, once you get into a rhythm, you just fold up all your cap shingles and then I'll show you how I glue them in place, okay? Okay, so you can see where I start one on the bottom here and then I just overlap them up to the line. I just already a split in there. That's the guideline that I use when I lay on the next shingle. I'll just put a little wick of glue on there and then I just get it on there with my number 11, move it around a bit, line it up and just pinch it in place. And like I say, once you get alone, you turn off your phone, <laughs> um, You'd be surprised how quickly you can move along and shingle the roof this way. And I find that, once again, like this is the part that really makes the roof shine, this detail, especially when you go to paint it. It uh, really makes a difference, as you can see. Um, this side here is done, and this roof. And then i got to clean up this here a bit more and then just finish off like this, okay? Okay, so this is the last shingle. And I'll have to tell you, like I decided that I wasn't gonna go to bed until I got all this done. So I've worked on this for, I don't know, five days, I think. Not full days, but just relentlessly at night and sometimes during the day too, when I found an hour here and there. And uh, I'll have to say that this is the most, uh, out of all the builds on River Road thus far, uh, roofing this station is, was the most taxing. Not stressful, just tiring. Like just, no, it just didn't seem to end. And uh, you know, I'm still not quite finished, but I'm pretty close now. And I'll just say this right now. Um, See how I added the rafters? See, I added them at the end. It's just much easier, particularly in HO scale to do this. If uh, this was built in O, you have more room um, per square inch to work and you can kind of factor th things in in uh, 148 scale a lot easier than you can in 187. You can see that, um, you know, they're just extensions, right? See? And they're to hang the eaves off of. See that? So because the eaves, which I'll also show you, I made with, this is how I make eaves for HO. It's, well, it's one method. Channel number 261. There's the trough, the eaves trough, right? 
that's all you really need. You don't need it to be like fully deep where I add this, I could take this half round and I glue it to the bottom right, of the trough to make these eaves. Okay, and um, with these rafters, because this model's up front, it's more of a fine scale kind of OCD project. Um, I can come in here. Yeah, I'll just do it at the back here. So I'll come in here and I'll just snip these off. Probably a little bit deeper than that. And then I'm going to glue just so that these sit underneath the shingles because I went to all the trouble to do these shingles. So I don't just want to just, just glue these onto the shingles, right? I want to mount them onto the rafters the way they would be prototypically, right? Now, if it was just a slab roof and maybe a different project, I might not go that far, but I'm definitely going to do it on this project because I'm not going to do all this work and then let it go to waste by just, you know, getting in a hurry and cheating it, right? Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay, you can see I'm almost done with the eave troughs, or the gutters. You can see you got it on the back here. I put a little bit of a trim, a 10 by 20 thou trim. And then I'm doing the down pipes too, on the corners there. And trimming back the, well these are actually false raft, uh, false rafters, or dummy rafters, because, um, you know, they're not, like they run into the dummies underneath. What I mean is, is it wasn't framed up like a real house exactly, but no model is like this. But um, so what I'm doing now is, is I'm just taking these, I'm snipping them off flush to the plate underneath the shingles. And once again, this is the advantage of uh, shingling a roof like this, even though it's quite a bit of work. But the reward is great because it looks awesome. So you can see now I'll mount this eave. It'll sit just under the lip of the shingles so the water runs off into them. Um, that's the advantage of doing shingles like this. They look cool when they're done. And you can just see the trim there. Um, this is the 10 by 20, so this will get nipped off. And then I'll put a trim on that return eave trough. And then I got to do these two up here, and then all the eaves are done. Okay. You can see what I'm doing here is I'm, uh, I am I want to make sure that I cut this opening and then do the flashing for the chimney. And uh, I'll show you the chimney in a second, the one I'm going to use that I just sort of picked up as an impulse. That's why I love working in plastic because you can just, like it's so stable, eh? Like once it's 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 settled in, like once the model is assembled and the solvent welds have cured, because they do dry quite quickly, but they, they have a cure rate as well. I guess it has something to do with the molecular chemistry of plastic and solvent. You know, um, I mean, I'm not a chemist, so I don't really know, but I just know by feel. I just know that when the next day when I work on a model, it, like it feels harder. It feels more solid. Um, and this is really super solid building, so I can really manhandle it. I've mentioned that before, just from experience. Um, you know, I've learned to build models this way because, you know, you got a reef on them sometimes, right? 
and if it's built too light it'll it'll break it'll you know crack oops you know plastic's not like that though so uh, i picked up these here just at the local hobby shop monashi laser engineering chimney brick style they're laser cut from wood they're kind of cool they caught my eye and then i put a wash of uh burnt umber on them i could pick out some of the bricks but they look quite good I, I, you know that impresses me for wood you know once again like nothing wrong with wood you know uh, all around if you choose to use that material to build with but um i might put a pipe on the top here with the flashing so it's a little bit more modernized even though these buildings were originally built in 1910 or you know the first designs were 1910 and they're built through the early part of the 20th century um, when they were restored or sold like sold and then restored obviously they would change up some of those things so i'm going to build the flashing right onto the bottom of this chimney i picked this position based on a lot of photographs not i mean the prototype fort langley ones like this but it's a little bit larger but i really like this size that's kind of why i grabbed it you know how you hunt around and for detail parts it just has a really nice uh, balanced uh, size uh, for this building. So that's what I'm going to use there, okay? And I'll build that flashing ahead of time because I want to get this done like any kind of fittings like that before I paint it. Okay, I just want to show you a couple of eave details. Well, here's the downpipe from the eave. So I'm just making this from here. I'll show you this in a second, then adding flashing to the chimney. But I just want to make a quick note here too. Like when we model a prototype, for example, like on our model railroads, like who's to say that, okay, so this is a restored building, right? In 2024, but it was restored, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago or something. But so like, for example, like this bench here may not have been prototypical to this station, right? They were wood. Now I found photos of, uh, cause there were so many of these stations with wrought iron. So, but whether they were particular to this station, I don't know. So when we model, like it's okay to, you know, you know, right. To do the same. If that's the context of the model on your, on your, on your layout, like this is a restored station that i'm doing on my layout in more modern times so it's okay these kinds of things right sometimes we get kind of you know this sort of narrow view that it has to be exactly like 1920 or something but then your your railroad is dated you know 1990 or something like why like why should it be right because it has a history and a story okay so like these little things here are a little bit fiddly to do but um i find that it's these are the kind of things that when you zoom in close to a model to inspect it, you're always looking for something that maybe might betray its uh, miniaturization or authenticity as a model, like when you look at it, right? Like there's dead giveaways. Like, for example, uh, like an end scale, uh, the way, like some end scale layouts look so nice uh, that you can't hardly tell whether they're HO or N. But how you tell is, is uh, you just look at the track, right? Because some people have been able to solve the physics problems, you know, like the wobble. But um, you just look at the, at, at the heavy uh, code of the track, right? Because most people are using, you know, code, you know, code 70. But the more discerning modeler will use code 55 and code 40. And even then you can sort of tell. So you can sort of tell when you look at a building, when you look at like a pipe like this, it reinforces the illusion, okay, that uh, things are like in scale, like they're authentic. Like, I'm going to add some flashing. So this was just made from 5 thou. Now, this is 10 thou, this bottom plate here. I just cut from scrap. And then this is 5 thou. So if you can get the 5 thou evergreen plastic, it's nice because you, you can use it for flashing. You can kind of melt it. And I'll just quickly show you this like on the roof here. You can see, well, it's not in focus, but anyway, uh, you get the idea. And this is like flashing. You can you can crease it in the center like that and then lay it in and it kind of melts. You got to be careful, but but that's what you want. You want a little bit of a melt factor. So these, so the little details matter, right? 
at the end of the day, I think anyway, okay? Okay, I'll insert this uh, wedding aid for stain painting. See that? Concentrated additive for reducing surface tension of water and for stain painting, and for stain painting, and reducing tension of water. Now, it's, it's a known fact that liquid dish soap, like Dove, a couple drops will work in a bottle of water like this. I put three to six drops, bang, 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 into a full size like that, right? Okay, so, and this goes a long ways. Like I use this to thin my paint with. I don't use it to clean my paint. I just use a regular jar off camera to the side to throw my brushes in. But uh, this is what I use by Golden. I use Golden and Liquitex, hashtag no sponsor, okay? Um, but this is excellent. I love it. Uh, I, I like it better than soap because it doesn't create any kind of bubbling or anything that soap tends to do, unless you use too much of it. But I would bet you it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, but uh, anyway, it's just a wedding aid, and it really makes a difference, a huge difference when you use watercolors and water-based acrylic paints like washes. It helps the uh, colors and the filters to spread evenly. It doesn't make it cause unnecessary tide marks and things like it would if you didn't use it, okay? Okay, so I want to show you how to do this uh, or paint this roof in three easy steps. So the first one, like the main one for this was fail. Like the first part was worked out, but then the other subsequent layers were failed. The audio failed on the video. So um, I'll use this last part it didn't do the kitchen so i just take just regular water so there's no primer on this right this is the tc uh, train shingles okay the asphalt shingles okay right here so there's no primer on this nothing they're just the raw plastic and that's the trick okay why because i'll show you just take some tap water. You don't need any flow aid or anything. Just regular tap water. <clears throat> At least the tap water from my area works with this. And you just wet it down. And then I take 71.057 black, flat black Vallejo air. And I just dab on some like this. All right. You don't have to think about it much. Like not, like not much. Okay, I should actually cover the sides of this, but I'm too lazy. I'm just swamped lately with stuff. Um, so I'm going to do that. Okay, see that? Uh, maybe I'm going to add just a little bit more. And then give it a once over like this, straight strokes down. Don't get any overspray on that. I'm going to leave that, okay? And then what will happen is it'll dry and some of the shingles are going to retain a center spot of black on them. So it'll be varied on all of them. Some will just have a bit of a filter. Some will have darker spots. And that is going to lead to this, okay? Without having to individually paint and do all that work just to get that effect. You can just do it with a few strokes and a few coats, okay? So when this is dry, I'll show you the next thing that I do and then the final one.
Okay, so here's the second step. So I have this Liquitex. It's called Transparent Burned Umber. It's the Liquitex Acrylic Ink Line. Okay, and the nice thing about inks is they're super concentrated, like the pigment. So they're, for staining, they're, like, I'm not going to thin this at all. It's a straight, like, it's got a little eyedropper, which is kind of nice. Just put a drop on your palette there. And then what I'm going to do is, is um, I'm just going to take this straight, just wicks into the brush real nice, too. And I'm just going to lay it on and then stroke it down, okay? And it's going to sort of, uh, there's a bit of tension still. That's good. That's what I want. Um, and I'm just going to stroke it down, just cover just it with a, with a kind of a glaze like this, okay? Put it on liberally so it gets into all that engraving of the shingles. I'm taking a bit of a risk here. I should have masked off the side of the building because it's all finished. But, ah, what's, you know, let's... Have a little fun, take a risk, right? <laughs> okay, so now that it's on there, see that? It's sort of a brown roof. It doesn't look bad like that, eh? Um, I'm just going to take this damp, so it's just a damp cloth, right? A little piece of cotton. It's damp. I squeezed all the water out of it. And I'm just going to wipe it down like this. Okay? Just a couple times, and then leave it. That's it. See how it's changed already? That's just two, two coats, right? The flat black, water-based Vallejo. You can use any water-based acrylic probably for that. Don't use isopropyl alcohol or Tamiya. Okay. You can see I got a little bit of a black there. That was from the early, see that? But I can fix that. But anyway, um, so the flat black wash, let it dry for a few hours and then do what I just did with that. And that alone is actually good enough in some ways, isn't it? Right? Now the third one is where I take a super light white Tamiya with IPA, super thin, like 2% pigment, 98% alcohol, and just dust it over and then it's good to go. Okay. Okay, so here's the uh, third step, and this is just some beige white or dirty white, whatever you want to call it. It's not totally white, but it's so thin that like you got to shake it up really good to suspend what little pigment there is. Because, well, here I'll just show you on the paper this, like you can hardly see. It's so, see that? It dries. See how little pigment there is in there? So, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to dust down the roof just a tiny bit, like that. Just a little bit of random fade on the roof. And then I'll just leave her collar done, okay? So that's all it takes, is three simple steps. And you don't even really need to do the airbrush step if you don't have an airbrush. And if you do have an airbrush, it doesn't matter what kind of airbrush it is. It can be a cheap airbrush of any kind, okay? And also, just want to mention one thing. I was looking around in forums just a while ago, and there's somebody was saying that, Oh, Boomer says that Badger and Pache are overrated airbrushes. See, this is how people start rumors, right? Like, that's a lie. Like, that's not true. Like, somebody with, I don't know, maybe ADD didn't listen to the video. I don't know, but I've never said that. This is probably made by or owned by Badger. I wouldn't have known that Badger purchased them, but I never, ever said that any of these brushes were overrated. I said they were underrated. And I've had this brush for, I've been using it for 26 years. And the tip is like a rusty nail. <laughs> it shoots fine, right? It's funny how people are like that, though, eh? Like you get on forums. I don't spend much time on forums, but a lot of the nonsense and trolling that goes on over there, and they hide behind their avatar. I wish they'd come over to my channel and ask me, you know. Uh, I'll give them a straight answer, you know. But if they're going to spread rumors, come over here and say it under the comments so I can address it. Stop hiding. Otherwise, don't say things that aren't true, you know. It's just you know ridiculous but i know who they are i know where they hang out and it's too bad that that has to happen but you know how it is but anyway so once again flat black thin wash burnt umber wash you can probably even use paint burnt umber as long as it's thin you don't have to use ink and then there's just a light dusting on there which you could probably dry brush as well and that's all it needs now what i'll do to finish is i'll just paint the edge of this fascia here I probably won't put a gutter here because a lot of times they didn't. Sometimes they did, but sometimes it just dripped off the back because it has a more 
liberal overhang there like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I call her done, right? Okay, cheers. Okay, so a goal achieved is a reward earned. I finally finished this station and, I, and I've, it, it, it just feels awesome. But you know how I finished it? I made a list. Yeah, that's right. Just like I make a list for everything. Like I broke break down, for most of you know, River Road is made up uh, officially and tentatively of three sections. Section one, section two, section three. That was the plan from the very beginning. And then I made pr lists or goals for section one, which I achieved. <clears throat> They're not all done because there's a couple, excuse me, <clears throat> there's a couple of nautical subjects that I had on the list for 2023 that I didn't get completed. I didn't get the tug done, but I did get other things done that weren't on the list. So I can't remember them all, but I know I achieved other things that I had never planned, which sometimes happens because you can't build chronologically. Like you can't expect to build one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all on the list. Like you just go back and forth, but you need to have goals though. And I find if you section off your layout, like if you know it's full length and size and you section off, just focus in. That's why I talked about the postage stamp scene. Like when you model a section of scenery, really what I'm saying metaphorically is, is just handle one small area and stay with it. Because if you do it to your satisfaction, you'll expound upon that. It'll grow out, like it'll grow out from that. Like this model here, I had to make lists like, you know, build structure, build foundation, get windows, glaze windows, shingles. Yeah, that's right. I knew I had to do them, but I had to write it down. And then I started crossing off things. And then it's like, you know how you get to the end of a model and you go, oh, darn, I forgot the chimneys, right? So I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to uh, make the chimneys this time. I'm just going to buy them. I bought these laser cut wood chimneys. I put a little wash of rust and they just, they popped. That was it. I think I put a little bit of plastic trim on the top and a bit of gray and some flashing and okay, good enough. Let's get her done, right? And so I'm really pleased with the way it turned out. So you can see the wiring, right? But before, okay, I'll show you. So I had to drill a hole under here. That's 5 sixteenths. But I didn't drill a 5 sixteenths hole. I drilled a smaller hole and cut it out with a knife. I didn't want to take any chances. I would have drilled it ahead of time, but I didn't know. I didn't know all the wiring was going to go through this back room, which is sort of blocked off by the kitchen. This is a dry fit and it's almost airtight the way I designed it. So there's no light bleed. But anyway, there's four light uh, features on here. So they're all going to go down through there and then down into the layout. But let me just say one more thing before we go up to the layout. So setting goals is important, right? Because if you don't, you won't achieve your goals and you won't receive the reward. Like I had for 2024, I'll tell you what my goals are. They are quickly, uh, let's see, River Road, the Tug, the Ferry, Ipex Plastics and Duncan Way Crossing, which I finished. I finished Duncan Way Crossing pretty much. The overpass was done last year. The Ferry, I doubt I'll get that finished this year, but I'll get it started. The Tug, I'm definitely going to finish this year which was on the list for last year, but it wasn't, I didn't even plan to even get into the tug last year. I just tried to, and then it was bogging me down. It was affecting my, my layout uh, production. So I had to pause it. So I'll have to revisit that to finish it. And then, oh, equipment. Okay, so I also had a goal to get two items like for production, another light, another studio light, and a new lens, which you're looking through now. And that was the big one. And the most expensive one too, right? I don't want to say how much it was, but lenses are an investment when you have an SLR camera. And I'll tell you right now that this one's a Nikon 12 to 24 millimeter 1.2. And it is, actually it's the best lens that Nikon's ever made, I think. But I got it for a really good deal. It's an older lens, but it's made in Japan and it's glass. And it is awesome. 
like I mean really awesome like here like you can like I like it's wide angle but I can still zoom it but it doesn't the aperture doesn't change nothing changes like it's it's a beautiful lens right and I always wanted to get one but early on it was just not something that was one of my goals but now it is so I achieved my equipment goals for 2023 already and I hope to achieve uh, Ipex Plastics, the Tug, and possibly the Ferry, but I might save the Ferry for 2025 or the winter because Section 3, I'm playing around with Section 3, and there's some terrain work I want to do there. It just depends how the production queue works out and what I feel is trending and what uh, people might want to, um, you know, see or whatever, okay? So let's go up there and let's have a look what this looks like, and I'm really excited that this completes the first two-thirds of Section 2. Okay, so here's the station, and does it ever look awesome? But let me just say uh, something first. Uh, this lens, uh, this is my new Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter 1 2.8G. It is, oh my goodness, what a lens. Well, it should be, right? I paid like really big dollars for it. Um, so I'll give you an idea. I could probably buy five scale trains locomotives with the money I spent on this lens and it's worth every penny and it's the best investment I could have ever made for this channel but anyway I'm just learning how to use it so it's an excellent low light uh, Nikon it's I mean I always loved Nikon I use Nikon all my life and um, uh, I've never had a lens as good as this though like this is as good as they got this is like so I'll just give you some uh, specs. This is being shot at 160 shutter speed at 5.6 with an ISO of 800. And I just got a small light down the track a ways. And my goodness, it's unreal. So here's the lights. I'll put the, the um, okay, the waiting room light on down there. See, on the far end. And I'll put the ticket office on. And then the baggage. The baggage is cool. Isn't that neat? That's quite bright there, but it looks really awesome. I'll try to show a couple other uh, just um, stills from different angles. But anyway, really love the st station. Really glad I built it. Um, it's a perfect fit for the beginning of Section 2, especially when you look down from this angle. Probably doesn't photograph as well facing the other way with, you know, modernity there, you know, <laughs> clashing with 1915. But... Uh, I don't really care, you know. That's the nature of doing a sort of, I don't know, a movie set type miniature 187 model railroad diorama style shelf layout, you know. <laughs> That's a mouthful, eh? But I love the station and it looks really good. And it looks better live, obviously, but um, it's uh, nice. I'm really glad that I waited, right? Because if I hadn't waited... I wouldn't have had this lens. I mean, I did get a deal on it. I really did, but I'm so glad I got it because it'll cross over to any most camera upgrade bodies if I do. But I love this D5500. I use this an older body and it's just awesome. So, um, yeah, so thanks a lot for supporting the series. Thanks for, you know, to all my subscribers for supporting the channel the way you do uh, because it's your support that allows me to afford upgraded equipment and stuff right that's part of it and i also picked up a new godox light to a soft light which is what i'm using right now so there you go uh, those were the two channel um, investments i wanted to make in 2023 and i did them as soon as i could and we're off to hopefully having a really great year and i hope to up the game a bit for all of you and you've upped it for me and thank you for all your wonderful comments encouraging words and happy modeling to you, and we'll see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>